Uh, I'm taking the Bring the Family Address uh, title seriously tonight. Um, much of my family is here. I'd like to uh, briefly introduce them, so please indulge me. Kathleen McDermott, my wife. Alistair McDermott, my nephew, here in the front row. And I'm also fortunate to have uh, my brother, uh, James Rodiger, is here. Uh, his partner, Jim Moore, is here. Uh, my sister, Betsy Temple, is here. And my sister, Ellen Brown, is here. And she has with her her husband, Peter Brown, who's also the co-author on my book. And to indulge you one more moment, uh, I have a blended family that uh, our parents were married um, and we became a family 60 years ago this month. So it is a uh, pleasure for all of us to be together and to be here with you. So uh, thank you. Now, um, I have a deck of cards here. I'm, uh, they've been thoroughly shuffled. I just about dropped them all. I'm shuffling them up some more. Uh, Nelson, I'm going to hand these to Nelson Dallas. He will have longer than his usual 30 or 40 seconds, but he will memorize them and say them off when he comes up here. There you go. Totally shuffled, believe me. Uh, I've seen him do it. He can really do it. Um, A month ago, in San Diego, just down the way, we had an extreme memory tournament. It was co-sponsored by Dark Neuroscience and Washington University in St. Louis. Nelson Dallas helped to organize it, along with me and some people from Dark Neuroscience and Kathleen McDermott and a few others I'll introduce later. Mary Pick, who is here, Kathleen. Um, and it was really exciting. And this is this whole idea, as Liz mentioned, of memory tournaments is a relatively new phenomenon. I'll talk about it in a moment. Uh, so it's brand new in one sense. Here are the three winners on the screen. Uh, Simon Reinhardt uh, won the overall tournament. Uh, I won't describe the entire thing. It was the first time anything like this had been tried, although there have been other kinds of memory tournaments, and we hope to make it an annual event. It was written up uh, on Tuesday in the Science Times, uh, so many of you saw that and have been talking to me about it. However, the technique that's used, the art of memory, is really about 2,500 years old the ancient Greeks first developed mnemonic techniques. And I won't go through the legends of how it's believed to happen, uh, but the, uh, they were able to perform prodigious feats of memory. And the Greeks passed this along to the Romans. There was no writing then, there was no paper, there was uh, obviously uh, the things we take for granted today uh, you couldn't use. So if you wanted to remember, if you were a Roman senator and you wanted to remember a two hour speech, uh, for the Senate, you had to remember the points you wanted to make for those two hours without the help of teleprompters or PowerPoint or anything else. And so people used these mnemonic devices to do that. Um, and in ancient Rome, they even had uh, uh, slaves. They would pick bright slave boys and girls and uh, train them in the arts of memory, and then the wealthy Romans would have a little, like, personal computer with them, Some, something like your personal devices to remember the things you want to have remembered. Uh, they were called Greculi for little Greeks. There are books about this. I don't want to go on. I like this one by Francis Yates because of this image on the cover uh, where it says the uh, imagination, uh, ocular imagination is uh, on the front, imagination of the eye. And visual imagery is a critical part. To be able to imagine things is a critical part to all the mnemonic devices. And the ones Nelson uses, the ones the other memory athletes use, uh, it's key to all of them. And there have been famous cases over the years. Here's a case of uh, Matteo Ricci, who was a Jesuit priest who perfected these. He had uh, memory palaces, as they're referred to. Here's one that he used. He had all these locations memorized in this palace, and he would then uh, use this palace to lo uh, store memories, and then he would go through the locations later and retrieve them. I'll talk about this more in a few minutes. Now, you can still find a number of books about memory improvement. Here are three I just uh, pulled off the web. The one in the middle there, some of you might remember if you're older, in the 1970s, I spent more than 100 weeks on the bestseller list of the New York Times. Um, psychologists, strangely enough, even though there's a large number of us who study memory, psychologists have not been 
as fascinated with mnemonic techniques as we might have been. They were sometimes seen as they are in education as party tricks, uh, not worthy of our study, um, but I, I think that's misguided. There have been studies over the years, Gordon Bauer did a famous study in 1972, uh, and recently there's a book published by Psychology Press by Worthen and Hunt uh, on mnemonics, they called it mnemonology, um, that um, is quite good. What I want to do tonight is to tell you about three simple techniques that you could pretty much use when you walked out of the room tonight if you don't already know them. I'm talking, I know, to a mixed group of psychologists and non-psychologists. Uh, this will be pretty familiar to some of the psychologists in the room, I suspect. Uh, one technique is very simple, uh, the link method it's called, and basically what it is, if you take points you want to remember, say uh, Mark Twain used this when he, wanted, he, he made his living for much of his life as a speaker, and he didn't like to use notes because he liked to wander around the stage, and he perfected several mnemonic techniques, one of which was using the link method, and he discovered himself, he didn't read about it, but he would form an image of something, uh, uh, some character in a story he wanted to, t wanted to tell, he would form an image, and then whatever the next anecdote or story he wanted to tell, uh, he would form an image of that one, and he would link them together interactively. So linking one image to the next image, then he would link the second image to a third image, and so forth and so on. And he discovered if he practiced that, used retrieval practice, as we call it today, for a few times, he would have it down. And since he pretty much gave the same talk every night, it wasn't too much of a problem after a while. Uh, but the link method, if you want to remember a grocery list or anything else, it's a uh, uh, handy little thing to do. It just, again, involves images and hooking them together. A second technique, uh, the most popular probably of all the techniques, is the method of loci, loci being the Latin word for locations, or sometimes called the journey method or the place method. In this case, you find a series of locations that you won't forget. I use a path around my house. I can also use a path around my neighborhood, a path around my psychology department uh, as three sets of locations. They're not palaces, but they're, they do. Uh, they, uh, and what you do is you devise a set of locations, and then when you want to memorize something, uh, a grocery list, points in a speech, you again form an image of what it is you want to remember, and you put it in each location. So you form an image of the first thing and put it on the front walk in front of your house, the second thing on the front porch, the third thing on the front door, and so forth. And you're not going to forget those locations. You've got a permanent set of retrieval cues, so all you have to do is to mentally walk through. And because you've used these powerful images to store things, you can then retrieve the things you want at each of the locations. Occasionally you might forget something, but uh, with locations, uh, images, you forget one thing and you're in danger of losing the whole set. With locations, if you get, forget something at one location, you still can access the remaining locations. So that's the second. Uh, a third technique um, that I use that I like a lot is uh, called the PEG method. There are a number of PEG methods. There's dozens of them. It's the same principle as the method of loci or the journey method. And with the PEG method, you have a set, you develop a set of pegs on which you hang memories uh, in the metaphor, uh, following the PEG metaphor. And so the idea is you have a permanent set of cues to which you associate memories that you want to retain. So here's a simple number rhyme scheme that I used uh, that I like a lot because it allows you to do uh, some things that I can't do with, say, the uh, link method. So you memorize this set of number rhymes. Rhymes are easy to remember. David Rubin did a whole set of research on why this is true. One is a gun, two is a shoe, three is a tree, so forth and so on. When you get up to 11, you start cheating and say 11 is penny one, hot dog bun. You come up with three syllable words uh, and so forth. I've got these memorized from one to 20. And then when you want to memorize something, say a list of words if I'm in a class and I'm challenging the class to do it, you simply associate the image of each word. If chair is the first one, you have a gun shooting a chair, and so forth. And then you can, uh, again, you're not going to forget how to count from 1 to 20. You've memorized the peg words. So what you do is you look at each image associated with each of these peg words. 
uh, and it works really well. One thing, one reason I like the PEG system is for me, you can go backwards as easily as you can frontwards. So if you memorize a set of words and you tell your class, okay, now remember them backwards, they look at you like that's impossible. But no, if you use PEG words, you can. In fact, you can go backwards and do odd numbers or even numbers, whatever you want to do. It's very easy with these PEGs. Some people have locations with the same qualities. I don't. Um, now, uh, I did an experiment um, using these three techniques. I had a control group. This is years ago, 34 years ago at Purdue University. Uh, when I was teaching there, I published this study. But the only time I've ever studied, uh, published a study on mnemonic devices in Journal of Experimental Psychology. And I just taught Purdue undergraduates these three techniques. And I had a control group telling them pretty much to do, there are a couple of control groups actually, but one of them was just pretty much do what you normally do, remember these words in order. And the results, there was almost no practice. They, they uh, learned their locations, they learned their pegs, and I did, gave them one practice list, and then they had to remember three lists of words in order. And what this next, this graph shows is the proportion of, or I'm sorry, the number of words recalled in order using these three techniques, or uh, relative to the control group. And you can see the control group got about five, the link group got up to about 10, so they doubled recall just using the simple link method. And the groups that had some practice with the pegs and locations did even better. They were not different from one another, they're based on the same principle. So here, without much effort, without much practice, we show recall is much better using these simple techniques in a standard laboratory setting. Now you might be saying, well, why didn't you drop everything and start studying these things? Uh, I didn't, I went back to business as normal and studied actually retrieval inhibition and hypermnesia and other things I was doing back then. But I should have, and it always kind of nagged at me. Um, and most of the studies in the psychological literature are like mine. The subjects are given little training. They're not particularly motivated. These were introductory psychology students serving for course credit. They weren't given much practice. They weren't given a chance to really be good at using these techniques. And yet the results showed 100% to 156% improvement. So now you say, well, suppose we had people who really cared. Now we do. How good could memory become? And this leads to our current studies uh, that I'll talk about. In 1991, uh, the World Memory Championships were developed. Um, a friend of mine who's German says it's three guys in England who are in a bar in London, and they decided to say they were going to have the World Memory Championships. But uh, nonetheless, now they really are the World Memory Championships. Uh, countries from all over, uh, people from countries from all over the world participate. Originally, it was pretty much British. Uh, and we have our own champions, uh, championships. Nelson has won the US Memory Championship three times, and he places very high, but he has not yet won in the international championships. But he's North America's great hope to win the international <laughs> memory championship. Nobody else is close in North America. Uh, and now psychologists are beginning to take an interest in studying these people who are so proficient at remembering, and who for most of our theories of memory, they simply blow them out of the water, if these things are very general. So here are some current world records. These are just unbelievable to me. Uh, ben Pridmore, what, so one of the contests is, how many decks of cards can you remember in order in an hour? So if you think of interference in memory, which we all know is bad for memory, or usually is bad for memory, you've got the same 52 cards, you've got to remember deck after deck after deck in different orders. If you make one mistake, if you get one card out of order, you're out. Ben Pridmore remembered 28 decks or 1,456 cards in an hour. Four digits is what psychologists call memory span. It's, you know, if I say six, eight, one, three, two, seven, four, most of us get about seven. Well, Johannes Mallow got 364 that were written once, uh, I mean, presented once out loud to him at one per second, about the rate I was just saying those. Uh, Wang Feng, uh, another one is written numbers. You've got the digits zero to nine in random order, but you read them rather than hear them out loud. Uh, and you get one hour to do that. Wang Feng, a Chinese man, holds the record at 2,660 digits. Random words, 
How many words can you remember in order? All the stuff is in order. You get one thing out of order, you're wrong. Uh, Simon Reinhardt holds the record for remembering um, 300 words in order in 15 minutes. Now, uh, three colleagues and I became interested in this when uh, we were approached by a company called Dark Neuroscience in San Diego, and we started looking for ways, they were interested in identifying people with superior memory ability, and we're going about this in a number of ways, internet testing and, and other things, but one obvious way it seemed to us uh, was to look for people who've already shown their superior memory abilities. They are compete in the World Memory Championships. So my colleagues in this are uh, Kathleen McDermott, Dave Bologna, and Mary Pick. Mary is here and Kathleen is here. Dave is not. And we have spent the last few years uh, studying memory athletes. What we do, we, these were very exploratory studies. We brought them to St. Louis for three days of intensive testing in our laboratories on a whole battery of tests. Um, and we were asking, uh, for today's purposes, I'll just talk about two questions we were addressing. Uh, so we know they will be good at memory tasks on which they've practiced. There are 10 tasks in the World Memory Championships. There's a slightly different set in some of the national championships. Uh, but what about memory tasks we would throw at them that they'd never done before, at least as they were not the memory championships? And then we also ask, what do they look like on non-memory tasks? And uh, do they have superior abilities on things for which they have not trained in particular? So uh, here, are my, here are seven subjects in this. Again, three days of testing for each subject. Bryn Pridmore, who I just showed you holds that world records in memorizing deck of cards. Nelson Dellis, who you'll hear from momentarily. Uh, Boris Conrad, a German uh, who has a PhD in psychology, by the way, and studies memory athletes like himself. Brad Zupp, uh, who's from uh, one of the best people besides Nelson in the US. He's also a uh, clown. He went to the Ringling Brothers Clown College, so he does things like juggle and memorize. Uh, James Patterson's a high school teacher in England. Simon Reinhardt is a memory, one of the Extreme Memory Championships in San Diego. He's amazing. He's a 35-year-old lawyer. And Johannes Mallow, who has also won the World Memory Championships uh, several times. Um, so they're a remarkable group of people, and it was uh, great to get them to St. Louis. Who are our control subjects? Well, they were Washington University undergraduates. And usually memory researchers get criticized because our undergraduates are so good and everybody asks us, well, how do you know they're really representative of memory in general because you're teaching, or you're teaching a special population and using them as your subjects? After all, they're in some sense professional memorizers too. That's how they got to college. They memorized for 12 years to get there. Uh, but in this case, uh, the college students don't look so great compared to the memory athletes. So they're, they're a fine control group. They're probably roughly matched on IQ. Um, and then the memory athletes are older than the college students. So if there's one thing we know about age and memory, it's that even in your 20s, memory starts declining, and so does speed of responding. Both those things start going downhill in the early 20s and uh, keep going downhill, sadly. Um, so what uh, do we do now? Um, after this, we used a variety of tasks. I'm just going to talk about a couple tonight because I want to turn time over to uh, Nelson. Um, so we used some that were memory for just what they, we knew they were good at and some for things uh, that they'd never done before. In particular, I'll describe memory for non-words. They'd never practiced memory for non-words, nonsense words, uh, or uh, working memory, a task I'll describe in a moment. And then we also had tasks uh, that look at attentional control. What's their ability to focus their attention? Um, and I'll talk about those tasks in a moment. First, though, the word non-word task. Uh, we gave them, uh, both the control subjects and the uh, memory athletes, uh, a very difficult memory task. Remember, 100 words. They were presented at a two-second rate, so one word every two seconds. And then they were asked to recall the words in any order. We did that to help our control subjects because trying to remember 100 words in order was not going to happen for our control subjects. So we, we let everybody remember in, in any order they wanted to, but the memory athletes always recalled in order because that's what they know how to do. Then we did the same thing with non-words. So things like F-L-I-R-P. 
things that look like English words, they're pronounceable, the phonology and orthography are fine, they just don't have any meaning. So we had them study them and test them on day one, and then on day two, we gave them a surprise test again. Uh, the memory athletes had always told us, oh, we can only do this immediately. We flush out our memories as soon as we walk out of the room, and there's no way we could remember them a day later. So we decided to see if that was true. Here are our results from this study. Uh, the poor controls are on the left. Um, they, uh, they got 10 out of the 100 words, which is fine. That's what you would get, trust me. Um, the non-words, they did worse. That's the standard finding. They got about uh, fewer than half as many. On the right are what the memory athletes did. They got about 70 out of the 100 words after hearing them once. As I say, they're also remembering them mostly in order. And um, they did better on the non-words, uh, but they were very frustrated by the non-words. The first guy we tested was Ben Pridmore. He couldn't believe it. He said, I can't believe how badly I did. And relative to the words, they did do badly. They still beat the control. So uh, if, I'll bet you anything, if you put non-words in the World Memory Championships, they'd all figure out how to do it in short order. But it was not something they were practiced on, and their techniques didn't work as well as they had hoped. Could they do it a day later? Well, by and large, they could. Uh, they, uh, memory athletes uh, remembered the words they thought they couldn't remember. They hadn't used the same memory palace again. So he said, hey, remember those words you did yesterday? They did a whole lot of tasks. Words were just one of them. But they could go back to their memory palace and get about 75 to 80% of the words they had retrieved the day before. So they don't lose it as quickly as they thought they did. They might lose it if they'd had to use that memory palace again, but they uh, didn't, they told us. Now next, let me talk about working memory. Working memory is the ability to hold information in mind and work with it in the face of distraction. It's something we have to do. Imagine multiplying two numbers in your head while somebody's talking at you and you're trying to pay attention to them too. That's the idea of what working memory is. It's what can you hold and work with in consciousness in the face of a distraction. Um, and working memory is of great interest currently to cognitive psychologists because it's correlated with so many abilities. I mean, yes, correlation doesn't uh, necessarily indicate causation, but nonetheless, working memory seems to be implicated in a whole variety of abilities. And of course, there's a great controversy now going on about can we train working memory and therefore make our abilities better in other tasks? Um, so what we did was to use a working memory task developed by Randy Engel and his colleagues called Operation Span, I'm sorry, Competition Span or Operation Span. Um, we had people, uh, memory athletes, Uh, memory athletes. We also tax the undergraduates. Um, in the program we use, the maximum performance is seven. We thought that was safe because most people are in the two to four range. Uh, however, in our version, the memory athletes didn't have any trouble doing working memory span. Uh, they were up in the six and seven range. Only a couple of people, most of them, uh, I think five of the seven, uh, five of the seven athletes got seven, and uh, the others were a little bit lower. Uh, but obviously they're outside the range of the controls who are in this difficult version of working memory span, we're getting two. So the, the uh, memory athletes seem to, they've never done this task before. I mean, they've done memory for, work, for numbers before, but they've never had to switch back and forth. And yet here's a task on which they succeeded, even though they did very well. I wish we had one up to like 30 now. We were talking about doing that, uh, see what, what range of working memory they could get. Um, finally, 
we also measured, uh, you can think of working memory as kind of a measure of attentional control, how well you can control your attention and switch back and forth between tasks. Uh, it's very difficult to do. Uh, the memory athletes could do it. Uh, but, so we also asked about another attentional control task. This is something uh, for people who are not psychologists, sounds bizarre, but for people who are psychologists, we've been used to it. It's our friend the Sroop Color Word task. So uh, the job here is to look at words that are written in different colored inks. And what you have to do is to name the color of the ink. So in other words, for that first word there, you would have to look at it and say blue. For the second word, you would look at it and say red. Now the second word is called a congruent trial because the color and the name match. So as you can probably intuit, just looking at these, people are much faster to name the color of the ink in the bottom word than they are in the top word. And that's taken as a measure of attentional control. How much can you control your attention and focus on naming the colors and ignoring the words? That's your job. The results are here. I'll have to explain these. This is. Uh, reaction time, this is speed to name the words. Let's look at the controls on the left. The white bar is the congruent trials, that's saying red, when the word red is written in red ink. And then the black bar is the incongruent trial. That would be like looking at the word brown and saying blue. Uh, and you can see there's a 111 millisecond effect. This is bigger in older adults, it's uh, young adult college students are the best we've ever found at doing the Stroop task. But look to the right, and you see we've now found a group that's much better than college students. The memory athletes can do this test. They can control their attention much better. And they're faster, despite the fact that they're older and usually age slows reaction time. They are overall faster, and the difference uh, that what is called Stroop interference, the difference between the congruent and incongruent trials uh, is cut almost in half. And uh, so what we see is that the memory athletes do show a Stroop effect. I mean, it's still there, but it's much smaller. And so what we see from both the working memory and the Stroop task is, is people who are mental athletes really know how to focus and control attention. Their minds don't wander. In order to memorize huge amounts of information, you have to have laser-like focus. Besides using these mnemonic techniques, you really have to be able to focus. Uh, so in conclusion, we've shown that, of course, memory athletes have exceptional recall on memory tasks on which they're well practiced, no surprise, compared to college students. But they also show somewhat superior elevated performance on things like non-words, which they haven't practiced. Uh, but the two big surprises in our research so far to us as the researchers is how well they can do on working memory tasks, which are thought to reflect attentional control in part, and also on how much reduced interference they show. So a hallmark of being a memory athlete is not just having a great memory, it's being able to control your attention really well. So um, I have a shameless plug for my book with Peter Brown right outside afterwards. Uh, and then what I want to do next is to introduce Nelson Dallas, who will finish out. Uh, Nelson, as I mentioned, is three-time world memory champion. And you heard Liz say how he came to understand uh, the, uh, or come to, to the sport. He's only been at it now for five or six years, I think. And he's already one of the best people, uh, far and away the best in the US. Uh, and among the best in the world. So please join me in welcoming Nelson Dellis. Just to be clear, it's the US champion, not the world champion, <laughs> in case you forgot. OK, so this is the same uh, <laughs> deck of cards. Um, so let me go through this. Um, so three of diamonds, ace of hearts, king of diamonds, ace of clubs, ace of spades, Ace of diamonds, jack of hearts, six of spades, four of spades, seven of clubs, jack of spades, queen of diamonds, king of clubs, king of hearts, two of hearts, five of clubs, eight of diamonds, seven of diamonds, seven of spades, eight of clubs, nine of hearts, four of diamonds, seven of hearts, five of diamonds, 
two of clubs, 10 of diamonds, three of hearts, six of diamonds, five of hearts, eight of hearts, uh, two of diamonds, jack of clubs, eight of spades, queen of spades, nine of spades, three of spades, four of hearts, three of clubs, six of clubs, nine of diamonds, queen of clubs, six of hearts, two of spades, five of spades, four of clubs, uh, 10 of hearts, nine of clubs, king of spades, 10 of spades, 10 of clubs, queen of hearts, and jack of diamonds. Yes? Somebody can pick those up. Um, so believe it or not, that's just a, a lot of practice. Um, and I had a good amount of time to do that in, but some of you saw me, I just went through it a couple of times, a few times. Um, so don't forget this, it's very important and the point of my talk. Um, but even if you think you might, that's okay. Um, the whole point of this is to kind of show you that what I do and what all these memory athletes do is learnable. And at one point, I didn't have this skill. Um, I learned it over the years. I read a book and just practiced a lot. And uh, that's why I'm here. So just quickly, Roddy said a lot of this. Um, I won this year. I lost last year, which was incredibly frustrating. If you watched me on TV, there was a special, the one year that they, they had like this huge to-do with cranes and cameras on the Science Channel. And I lost, right? 11, 12, no 13. I lost in the finals. It was kind of frustrating. Um, anyways, it happens. It's memory. Um, uh, Alzheimer's activist. I, uh, there's a charity that I started. I'll talk about it a little bit called Climb for Memory, where I raise awareness and funds for the disease. And it's why I started um, getting into memory, actually, in the first place. And I'm a, a, an avid mountaineer. So I started in 2009 um, really getting into this mnemonic world because of this lovely lady. This is my grandmother. Her name's Madus. Well, that's her name that we would call her, which means my sweet in French. And um, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 2004 and passed away from complications in 2009. And uh, as she passed, when she passed away, it really got me thinking, could this happen to me? And is there anything I can do at a young age to you know, set myself up down the road to delay it or prevent it if it ever were to come to me as well? So I learned about this championship and that people actually compete and train their memories. Um, they all come together for a day or two. And um, like Roddy said, there's the US championship, there's the world's. There's the German memory championship, the UK, all this. So it happens all around the world. And they've been around for 20 odd years. And the really cool thing about it is that everybody who shows up at these things are everyday people who claim the same thing, that they just had an average memory and trained it with a few uh, books or uh, seminars or whatnot, and then practice, lots of practice. So I was like, OK, I don't have a very good memory, but let's see if it works. So I trained a lot, and within a, very, within a very short amount of time, I won in 2011 for the first time and followed it up in the consecutive years. Uh, I broke uh, three records. I've held a couple, and actually this year um, I got a new one, which was great. Um, I have the record for the international uh, memorization of cards, 40 seconds. And uh, this year I broke my previous record of 303 digits with 310 in five minutes. And if you're curious, this is roughly a 310 digit number in the background. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, this one, I'm really proud of the names. So I memorized 193 names in 15 minutes, um, which was, it's a hard one. It's always a hard one. So um, that's, that's what I do when I memorize. And um, along the way, learning a lot about these techniques and really learning about my memory and the whole process of getting better and faster at memorization, I wanted to share that with the world. So I started kind of combining memory and a passion of mine, which is climbing, uh, into this charity I call Climb for Memory, where I would climb mountains around the world and try to make a bit of noise and get people to turn their heads and, and maybe get interested about memory, their mind, and Alzheimer's as well. So uh, on the left here you have, um, this is the final ridge up Mount McKinley, the tallest mountain in uh, 
North America. And then the, left, uh, the right two pictures are Everest, actually. So the middle one is the last summit uh, push area, the, the summit triangle. And uh, that's me on the right in my Michelin man suit going up to the highest camp. And uh, I was going to mention that Roddy and his crew, this was in 2011. I was on Everest in 2013 as well. They gave me a bunch of Stroop test stuff to do. And I have nightmares about that thing. <laughs> It's just every day I had to do the Stroop tests kind of at different elevations to see how that would have, like, I mean, it was, my, it was kind of my idea, so was, thank you, but at the highest camp, it was the most difficult thing not to say um, the word you're reading and, and trying to say the actual color. Pretty fascinating. Maybe you guys will do a talk on that one day. Uh, so yeah, so my, my kind of things that I, I, I tell people, you know, you want to improve your memory, you want to have a healthy brain. Um, these are kind of the messages I try to convey. Um, it's exercise your mind, which I do via these memory competitions and training, but that can come in many different ways, doing your Sudoku, um, just staying active, learning new things, trying new things, challenging yourself, um, eating well, eating the right things, there's certain brain foods you want to kind of keep in your diet, being social, involving yourself with your community, and exercise. Exercise is huge for brain health. Um, but we're going to focus on exercising your mind uh, in this talk. I could talk all day about all these things, but you guys are here uh, to learn about the mind. So before I go into the next slide, what I'm going to ask you to do now is close your eyes, OK? And I'm going to describe a situation or a scene, and I just want you to do your best to visualize it and make it as colorful and interesting as possible, OK? So just imagine a room, an empty room. And in the middle of this room is Albert Einstein. OK, he's got his crazy hair. Maybe he's got his tongue sticking out like he has in that iconic photo. And there he is, and he is skateboarding on a guitar. Okay, So you can imagine underneath his feet is this acoustic guitar, and he's kind of riding around in this room, Okay, just being Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein skating on a guitar. And then next to him comes over a, well, comes over Frankenstein, the monster, right? And he's kind of got his hands up and kind of making a creepy groaning uh, sound. And you can see the bolts in his neck. And he suddenly kicks a missile. Okay, So he starts like playing soccer with it, if you will, with his feet, right next to Albert Einstein on a skateboard. All right, so we have Frankenstein kicking, playing soccer with his missile. And then kind of out of the other corner of the room comes a kangaroo. Okay, he comes bouncing in, bouncing around the room, and in his hands are, uh, are wigs, just a few wigs, just a bunch of hair in his, his little uh, kangaroo arms, and he's screaming at them. He's screaming really loudly at them. That could be a high-pitched scream. I don't know how kangaroo would scream. I don't even know what sound they make. Um, but the kangaroo is screaming at these wigs, jumping around the room. And then finally, in, in, in the other corner, you can imagine Chewbacca from Star Wars, in his hairy glory, um, he's playing basketball. He's actually slam dunking a fridge in the corner over there. There's a, a hoop set up, and there's a big fridge that he's managed to lift, and he's floating in the air like Michael Jordan and slam dunking it into a hoop. All right, so we had Albert Einstein. He was skateboarding around on his guitar when Frankenstein Monster came over and was kicking a missile. And the kangaroo was jumping around screaming at a wig. And finally, Chewbacca was in the corner dunking a fridge. So you guys can open your eyes. And essentially, what I had you guys picture there translates into this number. Right? This is obviously, right? <laughs> no, that's okay. You guys shouldn't even understand why that's so. But the main point I want to get across is that what you guys did, or what I had you do right there, is pretty easy. We can all do it. You know, it's, a lot of it was bizarre and silly and not real life, but our brains can do that. We can imagine things that don't really exist. We can exaggerate the truth, and we can add a lot of 
interesting things to it. That's interesting stuff. That's very easy for our brains to do. To look at this and to, to, to memorize that just so naturally, just by looking at it and maybe reading it, it's not. It just, you may be able to, and I'm sure with a bit of time you could, but it's, it's, it doesn't feel the same way. It's, it's, like, it's like hitting a brick wall. And it's not very appealing. It just looks like a bunch of symbols. So here you go. This is uh, what you just imagined. So that actually, the, in my, and that, so the reason that those numbers stand for these images is that's just my number system. Um, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But all you need to know is that 0155253 is Albert Einstein skateboarding on a guitar. 1003947 is Frankenstein kicking a missile. And the kangaroo 754, he is screaming 1-8 at a wig 3-0. And finally, 3-3-3-3-4-7-7 three, 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 uh, seven, seven is a fridge being dunked by Chewbacca there. So it's much easier when you add meaning. That's really the, the big takeaway from memory techniques. So, so why is that stuff hard? Um, well, it's basically our brains were not designed for those types of things. Those are relatively modern abstractions, right? Um, you know, the earliest things that hum the human brain had to kind of process was, were, you know, is this the right path to safety that looks like this? Or this path is to danger, right? Or do I eat this plant that's not poisonous versus this plant that is? Very visual things, and a number is not like that. That's something that's, that came pretty recently, uh, along with language and abstract ideas and names and all sorts of things like that, which our brains don't naturally just lock onto. So modern information is abstract. And the goal is we need to turn the things that our brain doesn't like to memorize, aka most things, and turn them into the things that it does like, namely pictures or images, things that have meaning. You already have a lot of associations to the, the things that you want to memorize that, have, that are pictures. So there's really two steps to memorizing. There are, some, there, there are names for techniques that we'll talk about and that Roddy talked about, but it all comes down to two things. One is visualization, which I'll talk about, and then storage, where to put those visuals, so those images. So when I say visualization, it's not as simple as just trying to close your eyes and see the thing that you're trying to memorize. Um, you really want to add a lot of detail, as much as you can, using all of your senses. Okay, so if you were going to imagine a pizza, and that you guys probably haven't had dinner yet, that's going to make you quite hungry the more we go into this. Um, but you want to really think about what that pizza would be like, right? Okay, so the drippy cheese, right? Like you pick up this slice and the, the cheese is so hot and fresh out of the oven that it's just dripping like on your pants or your, you, you can feel it in your hands. Uh, the sound of the cheese sizzling, right? What does it sound like? It's just bubbling, right? Um, the white flour on, the, on the, the, the crust, right? You can almost imagine what that would feel like on your hands if it got on there. The smell, of course. How good does it smell? How does it taste and how hot it is in your mouth? And the color, right? The color of the tomato sauce and the yellow cheese and the, the bready color of the tan of bread, whatever, yeah. You can picture it, right? Um, and on top of that, so that's using your senses. You want to also add mean, um, emotion and feeling to it. So you can get, this is where you get a little bit uh, interesting. You can make it funny, right? Try to tap into your uh, humor a bit. You know, maybe you have a, it's pizza, but it's, it's actually a, it's a, a shirt that you're going to wear made out of pizza. Um, or you can make it uh, grotesque, right? The tomato sauce is actually blood from a rat that got into it, right? And you're going to eat this tomato sauce with, that's actually blood. It's really disgusting. Or emotional, you're, you're getting married to this pizza. Love, right? You love this pizza, or you're throwing it away and he's crying, don't throw me away, don't throw me away. And a, a great one also is uh, sexual things, right? We, Imagine the pizza in a thong. I mean, you can go a little further, but this is the, the, the PG version. Um, but honestly, and it, it sounds silly sometimes to, to say that this is what I do when I'm competitively memorizing, but that, that stuff sticks. It, and that's, there's no, um, 
that's not a lie. And um, sometimes you come up with really uncomfortable and weird things in your head, but you kind of bite the bullet and say, okay, well, it's gonna make me remember it better. So you wanna add emotion, right? You're, you're using your senses, you wanna add emotion, and then also action helps really um, solidify these images as well. If you can get a little bit of movement in there somehow, like the, the placing of this, emo this sad pizza into the trash, that movement, if you're picturing that, will help you remember. So can you forget things? Yes, but it's not because you have a bad memory, it's pretty much these two things. You're not paying attention, which is obvious, you can't remember something if you're not paying attention, or, and this is really important because most people will just say, I have a bad memory, I don't remember anything, but that's not it. It's because you didn't make your pictures or your images memorable enough. You didn't add enough of that uh, visualization, uh, the texture, the color, the, the movement to your picture. So go back and, and really try to sit there and, and think about it and add all those components to make it more visual. All right, so with that in mind, that's the visualization step. Let's try uh, a list of words, okay? So I'm gonna give you just whatever, I'll read them off and you can try to memorize these as best as you can. This will kind of be a baseline, don't worry, we'll do one at the end where you'll actually remember all of them. So mustache, shrimp, knife, mirror, bicycle, pencil, onion, pool, skirt, tango, refrigerator, orange, lipstick, and taco. So it's 14 words. So who thinks they have all those? <laughs> no? Somebody usually raised their hand, and then I can pick on them. But uh, um, no, most people might, you might be able to pick out a few that you, you remember, and, and like Roddy said, the, the, the magic number's at around seven um, without any technique. If you were maybe using the linking method or even the method of loci, which we'll talk about in a second, you could have gotten all of them, maybe a little more time would have helped. Um, but the majority of you will probably not get them in order, um, but that's okay. So if you're feeling bad about yourself, this is good, because I'm gonna turn it around and you guys will leave with a, a positive feeling about your memory, don't worry. So there they are again. Um, okay, so you have this image, you, you visualize this list of things that you're trying to memorize, now what, is that good enough? Not quite. Uh, you need to put those images somewhere in your brain where you can find them, right? And that, that sounds bizarre, but kind of obvious, right? Like if you're gonna put something away in your room, or actually a better example is, is your computer, right? If you're gonna save a document, you need to say and specify where you're gonna save it exactly, right? Give it a name, put it in a folder, so that when you wanna retrieve it, you know exactly where to go find it. And if you kind of don't remember, you at least can you know, have a good idea, okay, maybe it was in the main uh, directory, and okay, it's probably under this folder, and then you can find it, right? Imagine if we just pressed save, and that was, it was just gone into the, the computer's memory somewhere. You couldn't even search for it, because you didn't even give it a, a name. So that's what we have to do with these memories, these things that we're memorizing. We need to give it a precise location in our brain and file it, mentally file it in there. And so this is the memory palace uh, method of loci, the journey method. They're all the same thing, just different names. And <clears throat> what you're doing is basically walking around a familiar place that you know. Doesn't have to be super familiar, but those typically work the best. So your house, uh, the office that you work in every day, your favorite walk through the park, one of your uh, memorable visits to Paris, whatever it may be that is meaningful to you, um, you wanna use these places because they're already pre-memorized, essentially, because you go through them so often or they were such an intense experience that they stuck with you. And uh, what you do is you, you pick out specific points along a path, a path that makes sense. So if you're in your house, you might start at your front door and make your way uh, up to the bedroom and you know, you're not jumping around, you're kind of mentally walking through it, and you have anchor points along the way, so these distinct places, so the front door would be an anchor point, and then maybe you walk in, and there you are in the hallway, that could be the second anchor point, and so forth. And each of those anchor points, you're gonna imagine the thing, the, the visualized image, 
of whatever it is you're trying to memorize interacting with that place, that space. So we're tapping into spatial information here, and you can get an idea of this dotted line, kind of a bizarre scenario, but this is kind of what's going to happen in your head with a list of things. You're going to turn them into these weird, silly, funny, grotesque pictures and store them along a path. So why does this work? I mean, you guys probably know this better than I do. I just practice it. But the brain is very good at remembering spatial information. And essentially, the information that you're using, the spatial information, is already pre-memorized. So you don't really have that extra thing to do. And the nice thing about having these journeys is the more places you have with more anchor points, and they can be as long as you want or as short as you want or as detailed as you want, essentially the more hard drive space you have in your brain. Right? So you saw some of those crazy um, records for memorizing 28 packs of cards, 2,600 digits. So these guys are using really, really long memory palaces or multiple ones string together. And an important thing also to note is that every guy in the memory championship world is using this technique. And if they're not using it, but they're competing, they're not going to do very well or not get close to the top. So let's try it again. But this time, we're going to do it with a different list, uh, list of words. And uh, we're going to all share the same memory palace. It'll be your first memory palace, uh, maybe. And let's use this, this space as uh, that first journey. So we have 14 words. You, know, you might think, OK, we'll need 14 anchor points, but we can do better. Let's store two words at each anchor. That way, we kind of save space. And we only need seven. OK, so we'll do a little path around here. I'll, uh, we'll figure it out right now. So maybe this podium will be the place that we start, OK, the first place. And interestingly enough, that's where that, uh, that phrase comes from when people say, in the first place. It's because somebody, back in the day, when they were memorizing poem, um, poems or speeches, they would say, in the first place. No, not when they're saying a poem. When they're saying a speech, I'm sorry. They would say, in the first place, and that would be their first topic. They were accessing that first place where they stored their image. So this will be our first place. Um, two will be this uh, screen in the back. OK, three will be this interesting uh, thing right here. <laughs> I don't know what this is. Uh, four will be this uh, speaker area right there. Five, let's make it the camera, uh, one of the camera guys in the back. Um, six can be the front of the stage. And then seven can be this chair. So we're doing a kind of a little loop here, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, right? Seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. OK, so first two words, we have giraffe and foot. So the first thing we need to do is visualize that. And you might say, OK, uh, there's a giraffe. I can picture a giraffe with a foot. Um, Got it, OK. But you got to really like sit there, and, and at least at first, when you get faster at it with practice, you can kind of get a lot faster at it the more you do it. You can just come up with these images really quick and know what sticks for you. But for now, let's really imagine there's a giraffe here at the podium. OK, and he's, he's, you know, he's a giraffe. He's really tall, right? You can imagine his color, um, and maybe he's got his purple tongue kind of like tangling out and, and, and moving all over the place. And he just lifts his foot on top of this podium. And he's got like a foot, like a, a, like a human foot, right? And it's just here, right? He's just showing all of you guys. And maybe it's a really disgusting foot, right? It's got like you can see the strings of smell coming out of it. And there's a bit of green toe jam or something really gross, right? Yes, yes. You want to make it really gross. Right, so we have the giraffe, and then he plops the foot, uh, the disgusting foot, on the podium. So that's it. All right. Next, we move to the screen here, and we have the next two words, which are galaxy and apple. So imagine instead of this APS um, signage here, suddenly it shows a picture of the galaxy, and it's you know it's one of these pictures where you just think, wow, the universe or the galaxy is our galaxy is so beautiful and and don't understand you know, the feelings that come with that, right? But then you notice that all the planets and stars are made up of apples, OK? And you know, these apples are maybe 
Think of the red delicious apples, right? They're just orbiting kind of slowly in space and you're just like, wait a minute, this, this was supposed to be really uh, emotional, right? Like this experience of seeing galaxy, but it's, it's apples. This can't be real, right? But these delicious apples are there. Suddenly you want to eat an apple. You can imagine what it would be like if you crunched into one, right? So you have this galaxy of apples up there. Next, over here, we have a rope and couch. Okay, so imagine that I'm lassoing with a rope, like I have a bunch of rope right here, and I'm just, maybe I have a couch attached to it somehow, and I'm just kind of throwing it into this thing and just shattering whatever this is, and it just, you know, it just goes to pieces all over the rest of the stage. And suddenly there's this, this couch just plopped right here, and uh, it's this really comfortable looking couch, right? So we have the rope, boom, explodes, and the couch lands right there. Next we have school and television. So imagine, we're over here, this is number four. Imagine there's a little schoolhouse, okay? You can imagine your typical schoolhouse. That's like the one building with the roof. And um, inside of it, and, and this is just resting on top of the speaker, inside of it is just, TV screens everywhere, right? And you can imagine kids go to the school and they just watch television all day, okay? There's, it's like a, your sports bar when they have multiple panels everywhere. That's inside of this school. And these kids are just getting their education from just televisions inside of this quaint little school uh, that's also miniature, right? So it's just there with awesome high-tech flat screen TVs, televisions inside of there. So school and television. All right, so in the back, that's where the next one, at the, t uh, the camera, we have cup <clears throat> and rose. So imagine the camera lady over there um, is sip she's filming me, and uh, this is very meta right now, and uh, <clears throat> she's got a cup in her hand with roses in it, right? And she's just drinking rose water uh, because that's what she loves, and she's you know, sniffing the rose, and um, you know, she's offering cups of roses and, and rose water to everyone around her as she's filming me say that everybody's getting cup of rose water from her. Um, so we had cup, right? She's got a cup with rose, uh, rose water in it. Okay, then we're down here where the kind of the cards are, the edge of the stage. We have uh, steak and button, all right? So imagine there's a big, juicy, huge steak just on the edge here that I've just dropped there and you can kind of hear that wet smack of it hitting the, the, the edge of the stage and it, it smells really good. You can smell it immediately, this, this delicious steak, it's cooked. And um, on it is a button, right? And if I press this button, another one just randomly appears next to it. <laughs> and I press it again, the button, and another one appears, right? Suddenly I have a stack of steaks that I can just get more if I press the button, right? So steak, button. And uh, finally, we're here. We have box and aubergine. And aubergine is a British or French word for an eggplant. You all know what eggplant is. And um, just imagine here there's a big box that I open up and a bunch of aubergines just come toppling out. Delicious aubergines and they're purple with the green little top. And maybe these aubergines actually line up on stage and do a little can-can dance because they have legs and uh, they're really pretty and, and cute and whatever. And uh, they do their thing and they jump back in the box, right? So you have boxes and these dancing eggplants um, or aubergines. Okay, so don't look. We didn't really memorize. We just kind of you just listen to me talk about crazy stuff. But let's go back through our journey and imagine or remember what we imagined there. So we were here, what was there? Giraffe and foot. Then we went over here, what was there? Galaxy apple, then over here? Rope, couch, over here? School television in the back, the camera lady? Cup in the rose here? Steak button, and finally? Box and aubergine. Very good. Well done. <laughs> So a few cool things about that is uh, you could do that in reverse pretty easily without much trouble. All you do is start over here and you just kind of flip the words around, right? So aubergine box, uh, button steak, and so forth. The other thing that's pretty cool is you're going to go home tonight. Well, this isn't very cool, but you're, you're not going to forget these words, unfortunately. Um, 
the mere fact that we did this process, you know, making it very visual and storing them in a way that you know where they are, they're in this room. Um, when you go home, you can just close your eyes and picture where I was standing, and you'll be able to remember those words pretty vividly for a long time. Um, I've had people where I did a talk and a bunch of words, and I saw them a year later, and they were like, Nelson, I remember those words. <laughs> Most of them are excited, but some are like, Nelson, I remember those words. I can't get them out of my head. Um, but the techniques work, and it's, it's funny because memory guys, we have dozens upon dozens of different memory palaces that we use because we're always memorizing uh, large quantities of things and we have multiple days of competition so we gotta kinda keep some fresh and empty. But we get really good at emptying them out and reusing them. So, you know, for, you, for memorizing a deck of cards, thank God I, I, I don't have the order of this anymore because um, I'm going, I, I will never need that again. I showed it to you, it's on tape, that's fine, I said it. I still have it in my head, but um, it's not useful to keep, right? So the journey I used, will I be able to use it again? Yes, I just let it sit for a few days and then I'll come back to it and I'll probably have forgotten a lot of it and I just tape over it. If I wanted to remember something forever, um, if I say I wanted to keep this specific deck of cards in my head for eternity, all it is uh, at that point is review. So it would just be, okay, I'd go home after this talk and kind of go through it in my head. And, and the nice thing is I don't have to look at the deck of cards because it's in my house where I stored it, right? And I just, that's, that's what I review. And then, you know, maybe next, tomorrow I do the same thing and for a few days I, I go over it and slowly taper off, right? Um, and eventually it'll work its way into my long-term memory. So there's different ways to use this journey method. One is for a quick thing when you want to go to the grocery store or remember a quick list and all you have to do is just, um, you know, you can use one that you've already used and just tape over it, so to speak. Or if you want to really remember some knowledge, uh, say the presidents or, um, I don't know, the periodic table and you want to always have that, then you would specifically choose a journey or a place to store that piece of information. So, there you go. Uh, I always like to end uh, my talks with this. Memories are all we have. Without them, we are no nothing. So please value your mind. Thank you. So I forgot. I'm going to do a demonstration. So the cards, that's cool because I, I did it kind of off the side. Because you guys are very interested in, in, in memory and the mind, I think you'll appreciate this. Um, makes me more nervous, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, Roddy is going to say a hundred digits that he's randomly generated, and he's going to space them out at roughly a, a, a one per second, which is how it's done in, in competition. And uh, I'm going to try and memorize it. Please do the same, or, or, or <laughs> try, try and do the same. And uh, I think, so he'll say it, um, I'll be memorizing, I'll take a few moments to put it together afterwards, and then it'll be up behind me, and uh, you can test me out. Okay, these are 100 digits that I uh, used a random number generator in my room this afternoon, and came up with, um, and he has not seen them at all, I assure you. Uh, also, I told him I have a slight speech impediment because I had tongue surgery a few years ago, uh, but he said, that's okay. He would persevere through my speech. So, so if, you, if you could do me a favor and just um, count down from 10, just so I, I have an idea of your, your timing, just so I can get used 10, to it. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, okay. That's good. Just Is that okay? A tad slower. I'm a little Test. out of practice with this, but we'll, we'll try it anyways. Okay, I'll go slower. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, so mentally what I'm doing right now is I'm going to choose a place to store these numbers. So right now I'm, one of my favorite places to put audio spoken numbers is in uh, this hotel I stayed in in Kathmandu before I climbed Everest. It's a really memorable place for me, and it's what I use whenever I, I, I typically do this. So. Mentally, I'm jumping to that place. I know where I'm at that first place, ready to receive these numbers. So please, as he's saying them, just try to keep quiet. I'm trying to concentrate. Try to do it yourself as well. And um, if I mess up, I'll, I'll try to I'll do my best, yeah. 
You ready? Yeah, just count down three, two, one, and then you can start. Okay. Three, two, one. Zero, four, nine, zero, five, one, seven, eight, eight, one, four, nine, three, seven, seven, two, two, six, nine, zero, six, zero, zero, eight, five, one, zero, five, three, four, seven, seven, two, six, five, zero, five, six, five, three, seven, two, six, one, two, four, nine, three, eight, five, two, seven, seven, six, six, eight, seven, six, five, eight, one, three, seven, eight, nine, four, two, four, three, zero, zero, eight, seven, six, one, six, four, five, eight, four, three, seven, 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 zero, seven, zero, five, three, seven, two, seven, zero, three, six, zero, eight, eight, six, nine. That was a hundred digits. All right, let me just go through it in my head. It might take a minute or so. Anybody out there want to challenge me? Okay, so do you have them up? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Let me know if I make a mistake. Um, I will tell you that 
I, I have a, I'll have a gap. There's one gap that I have of two digits, which I'll come back to and I'll figure it out. Um, so don't tell me. So it's zero, four. Skip the next two. I'll come back. Um, five, one, seven, eight, eight, one, four, nine, three, seven, seven, two, two, six, nine, zero, six, zero, zero, eight, five, one, zero, five, three, four, seven, seven, two, six, five, zero, five, six, five, three, uh, seven, two, six, one, two, four, nine, three, eight, five, two, seven, seven, six, six, eight, seven, six, five, eight, um, one, three, seven, eight, nine, four, two, four, three, zero, zero, eight, seven, six, one, six, four, five, eight, four, uh, three, seven, 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 zero, seven, zero, five, um, three, seven, two, seven, zero, three, six, zero, eight, eight, six, nine. Yeah? Okay. So let me figure out those two digits. Hold on, I just gotta, <laughs> I gotta get these perfect, hold on. Um, I, haven't, I think I know what they are, but let me just make sure. think he's eating a slice of pizza. Is it seven, eight? No. Ah, oh, I was wrong. Okay, hold on. Okay, so zero, four, well, the first two is, is Oscar de la Hoya, right? So he's, he's, um, hang on. I don't know. I don't know. What is it? Nine zero. Nine zero. Yeah, I wouldn't have gotten that. Okay, I'm sorry. So 98 out of 100. <laughs> Anyways, thank you.